Good morning, everyone in U.S. History 2. I'm going to put up a brief sort of summary of the highlights of Chapter 26, the Affluent Society, um, at least the things I think that are most critical. And one thing I think about history sometimes uh, is that it's viewed through different lenses, economic lenses, uh, perspectives about whether you're a male or female, sexual orientation, rich, poor, different religions. And so the book is trying to give us a broad snapshot of those critical junctures and issues that arise during a given period of time. But what I found refreshing about this chapter was more about sociological and cultural developments that um, were created during this period of time, along with economic. It's not all about political and specific dates. Um, and that gives me some some reason to take a moment to, to pause and say it's history is a much broader uh, field than it sometimes appears and you're only getting a limited snapshot and that's what what sometimes we call a survey course you're looking at some of the big issues but one thing i do like about this book one, one it's free but two it sometimes gets into this cultural and um, sociological aspects of historical phenomenon that occurred during a certain era and this chapter contains a lot of it um, very enjoyable chapter, uh, at least for me. It mentions a couple of things that certainly influenced me, even though they were before my time. They had ripple effects later on, one of them being the history of rock and roll, the advent of rock and roll, and there's some references to Elvis Presley. You know, I was, when I was a kid, I was really into Elvis Presley, but also uh, television shows that were iconic for my era, even though they were in reruns at the time. I didn't catch them in their sort of their heyday. But Leave it to Beaver is mentioned, I think, at least twice in, in this chapter. And uh, I grew up loving Leave it to Beaver. In fact, I have a close friend of mine who's also a graduate of the community college system. We both went to Springfield Technical Community College together. He went on to get a master's degree from Columbia and became a um, significant uh, educator in the New York State uh, school system. And uh, every so often we'll hear about a character, an actor from uh, the Leave it to Beaver show, either passed away or is in the news for some reason. And... Uh, we often uh, get together to lament uh, over a loss or um, or just to celebrate the nostalgia that's related to that era uh, that we think is often so important. So anyways, I digress. We're going to talk about what happened post-World War II. We have a huge economic um, boom. It's, it's an incredible boom. Uh, not only do we have a, a massive increase in the birth rate, so-called the baby boom, but we also have an economic um, thriving economy that lasts for decades. It's really an unusual phenomenon, but it's post-war pent-up consumer desire coupled with an economy that's fueled by post-war activity um, that uh, stays sustained, which is often surprising after a world conflict. When World War I, we had obviously the Great Depression afterwards, but not after World War II. We had sustained economic growth and the growth of the suburban um, middle class is, is very broad-based. The book does a nice job saying that and, and, and evidencing that wasn't enjoyed by everyone. Um, minorities, women were often discriminated against, and not just subtly. We call that a de facto sort of segregation or de facto discrimination, meaning that on the books, it's not overtly discriminatory, but it has a discriminatory impact. Some of the discrimination was what we call de jure, meaning on the books, on the law. And one of them is redlining, that the new governmental impetus to have people get access to home loans wasn't equally applied overtly, meaning that certain <coughs> neighborhoods that were often um, racially uh, made up of, of, of minority groups would be redlined. And that's actually a term that was derived during these surveys done by the government during this period of time. If they were deemed to be credit risk, they wouldn't always be eligible for some of these government-backed FHA loans and other loans that the government created post, well, actually pre-World War II in uh, the FDR's administration, but really took off after World War II. These be redlined districts, and they'd be redlined largely because they'd be deemed a risk, not because of really economic issues, but because of race. And it was it's a real tragedy. And that was going on right through the 1970s. It took a long time before the courts and the government recognized the great long that was occurring there. So the affluent society in this chapter wasn't equally applied by any means. And I think the chapter did a really nice job of talking about how, although almost everyone, including minorities, did very, very well in increasing their standard of living during this time, it wasn't equally proportional between different racial entities. No question about it. 
so the rise of the suburbs they did a nice job about levittown if you ever heard of levittown new york um it's actually levitt was basically a planner of communities and if you go to some communities sometimes you'll see all the houses or you'll see several distinct style of those houses they're not necessarily one next to the other identical but you'll see like a series of patterns of designs that seem similar because developers would do that they would develop entire communities urban planning or suburban planning became a significant part of american cultural history during this era um it was true everywhere I, I think about the community i was living in not too long ago in sturbridge mass there's a, a neighbor a cul-de-sac called old farm road and it's like every third house is like a ranch then every second house is a cape and, and i found out that almost all the houses except one little section were all built in the late 1960s by the same developer based upon plans and that's how urban development or suburban development started to occur during that era uh why is it different than pre-world war ii back in that era you had very stringent credit requirements in order to get a loan so home ownership wasn't open to everyone in the loans in that era is this partially led to the collapse of the economy were often five-year notes you had to pay back your loan in five years but it was amortized as if it were like a 20 or 30 year note what that means is after five years you'd pay a monthly rate that you might well be able to afford but then the economy collapsed you lose your job you might not be able to pay that but guess what happens at the end of five years there was an expectation of a balloon payment you'd save up enough money to pay off your mortgage really impossible and so the federal government through different programs fha being the biggest one you probably heard of before started guaranteeing many of the loans but also amortizing the entire length of the loan not for five years but for 20 and 30 years and that's what many of us do to this day um 15 year notes are available but usually at the option of the consumer to take a shorter note 15 years you're obviously paying a lot more each month but some people want to pay off their mortgage earlier so government program subsidies like h-o-l-s-l-c uh, which backed up and made um which stands for the homeowners loan corporation made it available with very low down payments and the government backed it up so therefore the private banks would be more likely to lend lending became much easier and then we know about the fha uh but the fha requires that okay banks you want to get backed up by the federal government you got to lower your interest rates you got to make the loans more accessible to people with you know mediocre credit and that opened up the credit market to an incredible vast amount of people and thus the suburbs become uh, massive and you know and there's different statistical numbers i can't remember them so i have to refer in the book between 1950 and 1970 american suburb population doubled to 74 million 83 percent of the population growth during that period of time occurred in suburban places i think that's very critical um television started to boom during this area it's obviously before my time uh but my dad always talked about this i love oral histories by just basically talking to people that lived through the period my dad said the radio was you know huge during the 1930s and uh, when he was a kid he was born in 29 and you talk about how the radio was massive when he was a kid gathering around it listened to news shows and things like that and he remembered the advent of television um which i don't think he had in his home until the early 1950s or his dad's home my grandfather's house and he said it was uh, really an extension of radio. And the book does a nice job saying many of the radio shows basically became television shows. And they were often live during that era. And you only got usually three channels, ABC, NBC, and CBS, if you had reception for them anyways. Um, and so there was a shared cultural phenomenon. Everyone watched basically the same iconic three networks during that era. And there was a shared experience as a result of that. I think you can't underestimate how that kind of creates a, a, a consistent vision or or um almost propagandizing especially during the shows during a time taught about what the nuclear family there was always a happy ending it was always about good morals and ethics within the family uh the nuclear family was critical to those shows and uh and it was a universally uh, shared experience by those of us that or those you know american families that had television during that period of time but the economic boom can't be underestimated in terms of i think the psychology of the era as well too in the 1950s and, and i love this quote from a businessman during this time i don't know how it was captured but I, I was glad that the author put it in the book it says if you had a college diploma a dark suit and anything between your ears meaning basic intelligence right um a, a businessman later recalled it was like an escalator you just stood there and moved up and my father always talked about that era during that period of time that you really, really could be anything you wanted to be in the jobs were available to you. If you were, you know, if you were white, I, 
and I don't want to sound like I'm, you know, uh, trying to do anything to suggest rape, race baiting or anything like that. But let's face it, these opportunities weren't available on the same level if you were a person of color or if you were poor um, or if you were in those areas that didn't necessarily jump on the ship of the rising tide, if you will, of economic success. There's always different seg segments of society that don't get to share in the great wealth and the affluence of this period of time, often earmarked between basically the end of World War II and into the um, uh, late 1960s. Yeah, it says many Amer African Americans and other racial minorities found themselves systematically shut out. That doesn't mean they weren't eligible for the GI Bill. It doesn't mean they weren't eligible for other programs that were helping America basically thrive. It's just that if you're in a red line district, you can't get the loans. And if you didn't serve in the military, although many African Americans certainly did, they'd be able to tap into the GI Bills and things like that. But they weren't always just as freely accessible in the same communities. And they talked about here, and here's the redlining I already referenced to here. It says basically the uh, the federal homeowners loan program actually would create security maps to determine which home areas were taboo. We're not going to loan to those areas because they're too high a risk. And so on its face, it sounds like they're being reasonable. But why were they high risk? High risk because they had significant um, uh, non-white populations, whether they be Asian, African-American, uh, Spanish, um, those kinds of areas basically wouldn't be part of the government assistance program. And it's really unfortunate. Those went on for quite a long time until the Supreme Court case finally turned it over. Yeah, they called it phrases like subversive racial elements and racial hazards prevail in these areas, and they would redline them. And sometimes you'll hear people talking about how we have to correct certain um, flaws in society in terms of the way we deal with race and and equity, and that doesn't mean necessarily equality, but it means equity, fair play. And um, and part of it is really the existence of redlining, uh, like I said, wasn't it's not ancient history. And it's finally been made through case law and legislation. It's now illegal to redline districts. But you can't tell me that that might not still be in the mindset of certain people that certain na neighborhoods and areas are, um, you know, suffered disdain because of the racial makeup. Yeah, and so the, thus the FHA policies and private developers increased home ownership and stability for white Americas while simultaneously creating and enforcing racial segregation. Um, and here's the case, 1948, but it wasn't always acted upon. There was still subtle sub, or, or subversive uh, discrimination. Shelley versus Kramer's the case in 1948. It said, declared racially restrictive neighborhood housing covenants uh, were finally banned. And you can still find them in deeds. I found a few before in the past uh, in studying history. One was actually owned by Justice Rehnquist. I don't know, died maybe 20, 25 years ago. Justice Rehnquist was a former chief of the Supreme Court. He owned a home. He didn't put the racial covenant in there, but there was actually racial covenants and deeds. And you can still have covenants and deeds that are restrictive, but they can no longer be based upon race as a result of this 1948 case. And what a, a racial covenant was, would literally be, you buy a piece of property, but the seller of the property to you would put in there that any future conveyance by you could not be to a Jewish person, could not be to an African American person, could not be to a person of Asian descent. And those deed restrictions actually existed. And how Justice Rink was gotten a little bit of trouble was he owned property that had a restrictive racial covenant. I, I don't think he could just, uh, uh, he could not, um, according to the racial covenant, I think sell it or transfer it to a person of Jer Jewish heritage or African American heritage or a Mexican American. Mexican heritage, although and Justice Rehnquist, I think, had a valid comeback. Says, I didn't put that in, and that was from conveyances many times before me, and it's totally unenforceable. It's basically null and void as a result of this 1948 case. So the Supreme Court rulings were starting to catch up with egalitarian views of how law should be applied and implemented. The problem is, is they still were not always effectively exercised, and we get to talk about schools desegregation in a minute. So, oh, that's right here, education and segregation. We know there was a famous case, 1896. Got to put this on the you know, the final exam in significant numbers. In 1896, obviously previous chapters, Plessy versus Ferguson, there was coach cars that were segregated. 
uh, for African Americans and for white. And African Americans sued, saying, hey, separating the races violates the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution. The Supreme Court said no. Not a unanimous decision, but a majority decision said, no, 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 it, the Constitution doesn't require diversity in intermingling of races. It just requires equal treatment. And so as long as the different coach cars are equally equipped and adequately supplied with the same amenities, you've satisfied the United States Constitution. Well, it comes to 1954, and there's a lot of evidence that segregating different races in different schools creates inequalities in and of themselves. And it's really five different cases that become attached to the one lead case called Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas. And what they're trying to argue is by segregating races, not only overtly do you get a secondary education. So they showed evidence of how much money is spent on a white student in a white school, as opposed to an African-American student in an African-American school. You know, the schools were dilapidated if they were in, you know, and they were, the, the teachers were less qualified uh, and the money actually spent in budgeting was much less so for uh, schools for people of color as opposed to white America, especially south of, uh, south of the Mason-Dixon line. Not necessarily untrue of the north either, but certainly in the south. They, um, they were able to prove that not only was there inequality in the way in which education was applied through segregation, but they actually also proved something unusual at that era in court proceedings, they were able to prove psychologically that separating races has an impact on people's outlooks. It's dehumanizing. It is. It creates a dichotomy of a sense of being an American, two different worlds within one. And the, the, there was many a good, great attorneys on that case, but one was Thorogood Marshall. He was the attorney for the NAACP, and he was able to prove that through sociological and scientific psychological studies, which was the rage in that era, they were able to prove that separating races creates a psychological harm to those who are treated as inferiors or desegregated because of their race. And because he was able to prove that a unanimous to Supreme Court, a lot of people say Earl Warren was very liberal. He's liberal, certainly on criminal rights, but he was the governor of California when they segregated Japanese Americans during World War II. He had no objection to that, but he evolves when he's on the court significantly. And Earl Warren and the other eight Supreme Court members, a nine zero, that's called setting the precedent, ruled that segregating races, even if the facilities are equal, even if the teaching quality, the books, the supplies, and the outcomes of education are materially the same, Segregating races is inherently unequal under the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. 1954, huge monstrous case. Uh, many in the South protested it. But here's the sad part. In a case like a year later, like, well, okay, as a result of that, what do we do? How do we fix it? They said, well, the South or the, those schools that are segregated by law need to be segregated with all deliberate speed, whatever that means. And they didn't do anything for years and years and years. And we know it really took until the 1970s where busing became the remedy to help create desegregation. Because otherwise, if you went to a school just in your neighborhood, there'd be what we call de facto segregation. You know, African-Americans would live in a certain area community because of long history of discrimination. They would go to their school in their community and therefore it would remain largely African-American. White kids would go to schools in their community, which is mostly white community, and therefore segregation still existed. And how do we really have to disrupt that? In public education, at least, in public education, the remedy they came up with, which is still very controversial to this day, was busing. And uh, I know one of my, I don't know if the students in this class, I think he had me a political science. I don't know, Will, if you're in this class, um, Will, Will did a paper on the history of busing. He did a lot of oral history, interviewing his father and other people about the experience he, he went through in busing. I'm a product of busing. I was taken from my neighborhood school that was right down the end of my street. Um, for my fifth and sixth grade year, I had to go to a different school in order to, I guess, make it, it more diverse at the time. And I remember my father being very upset by it. I didn't know what was going on as a kid. But I remember the controversy. I didn't know what it was about, though. Um, so education and segregation, we know this changes things significantly. Um, and here's the argument that I love how that was articulated. It was more on the social and spiritual degradation that accompanied legal segregation. It is, it is degrading. There's no question about it. 
So how do we enforce it? So a case came down later in Brown 2. It was called Brown versus Board of Education 2. And they said, with all deliberate speed, you got to stop doing it. And they told basically the Southern political leaders, fix it. And what do the Southern political leaders do? It's kind of like given to, let, let's take over the security for the, 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 the you know, the, the chicken coop. Let's, let's turn it back over to the foxes. Little was done until basically the busing cases came down. But we know the 1964 Civil Rights Act, often given credit to John F. Kennedy, um, he was dead in 1964, although the, the brewing of the 1964 Civil Rights Act did occur during his administration. It was Lyndon Johnson in the Congress during that period of time. Pass it, and that gave teeth to Brown versus Board of Education. They could enforce it with certain measures by withholding funds and other mechanisms that helped start to bring about uh, some of these changes and end some of the loopholes. Yeah, there's a couple of cases, Green versus uh, New Kent County in 68, Alexander versus Holmes. They finally closed those loopholes um, that they would give this freedom of choice stuff, which was nonsense. Um, and we know some of the famous cases where they actually, James Meredith, there was other students that had to be guided in with federal troops to at usually at colleges, but also sometimes in grade schools as well. And we know there was other things, the Freedom Riders and all these other movements. A lot, a lot of people would go into the, you know, and we do it basically, by the way, history is taught sometimes in high school and, and in other modalities that somehow the civil rights movement started in the 1960s. <laughs> really started in the 1700s right um but in terms of you know really coming to a head it was the 1960s but some of these really early marches and other protests and court actions were all during the 1950s and some of the early admissions of african-american students into historically white basically public institutions occurred during the 1950s then it was ike that started the process Ike doesn't get a lot of credit for it but he did yeah, and this first woman that did this thing, she was a service woman. She was in the Women's Army Corps. Sarah Keys, she, I guess there was a stop along the bus and white people got on. She was told to move the back of the bus. She refused. She got arrested. And she brought the case in this long, not long, well, fairly uh, the same year, actually, the case. But I believe it was a year or two before. Yeah, 1953, uh, that case went to the Supreme Court. And um, she said under the Commerce or her lawyers under the Commerce Commission ruled that separate but equal violated interstate commerce clause and therefore basically segregation and busing was illegal. But we know the Rosa Parks, Rosa Parks planned this. She was part of the civil rights movement. Uh, when she was told to move to the back of the bus, she knew she was going to refuse. She knew she'd be arrested and charged. And then basically it galvanized a big part of the civil rights movement to boycott um, the Montgomery um, uh, bus system in um in Montgomery, Alabama, and it worked, and it created a lot of pressure. The bo boycott not only crushed segregation in Montgomery's public transportation, it energized the entire civil rights movement and established the leadership of the then um, organization that was running it, 26-year-old Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and so all these things you see tied into history, and, and Martin Luther King was much bigger than the big civil rights uh, uh, icon he was in the 1960s. It all started in the 1950s. Uh, and pressure kept building in the Civil Rights Act of 1957 um, was a start. The 19 Civil Rights Act of 1964 is much bigger. It was a weak act, but it signaled that government was starting to respond to these long historical um, underpinnings of, of racial uh, injustice. And so, and I like the end quote here at the bottom of this section before we go into gender. It says, while the bus boycott, Supreme Court rulings, and other civil rights activities singled progress, there were still church bombings, death threats, stu uh, stubborn legislators demonstrated the distance that still needed to be traveled. There's a lot of resistance to it, no question about it. Um, and now we talk about gender and culture in affluent American society. Uh, we know the television changes everything, but also advertising and the consumerism is still focused on, well, it's sexism. It's focused on women because women are often, they're going to be the head of the household in the sense that they're going to be in charge of domestic, domesticity and raising of children. I know it's a sexist view, but that's what it was. Maybe arguably still is with some people. Um, and so the consumerism was geared towards advertising, appliances, and things. And don't forget, credit's wide open. Now, credit cards started in the 1950s, and so did installment plan payments take off. And so not only did anybody, you know, back in the earlier eras, you'd save up to buy a big appliance, It'd take you years. Now, you didn't have to save up not just to buy one, you could buy many all at once on credit and installment payments. And that created uh, a boom to the economy. There's no question about it.
And then it talked about television's broad appeal during the 1950s. I watched all these shows, and I wasn't born in the 1950s. I'm really a product. I was born in the 60s, but I was a product of the 70s in terms of, you know, being glued to the television way too much. Um, but they talked about I Love Lucy, Fathers Knows Bass. But what did it do? And Leave it to Beaver, of course. It idolized the nuclear family, traditional gender roles. And when I watched Leave it to Beaver, my, my father and I used to make fun of it, where at, at dinner or lunch, you know, dad was – dinner dad was still in a suit for crying out loud he wore a suit every day 24 7 unless it was saturday afternoon he was doing yard chores and he had a greasy sweatshirt on but still his hair was immaculate and the mother was always in like a like a fancy dress all the time no matter whether she was cooking or cleaning or doing domestic chores um and that kind of was trying to sell america on what it should be and we didn't live like that at least in my, not my house i mean my mother was i hate to say it a traditional not hate to say it but she was I don't think she did it by choice, but she was a traditional homemaker. She stayed at home and she, you know, cooked and cleaned and took care of the house and took, paid the bills and things like that. When my father went out to work and that was basically what um, was reflected often in the cultural phenomenon on um, in the arts and entertainment world of television and in the era. And I couldn't imagine my mother in a fancy evening dress all day long uh, while she had an apron on cooking meals. It was ridiculous. Um, and because of that ridiculousness, there was obviously an undercurrent of dissent and deviancy from those um, stereotypical ways in which families sh should reside. Yeah, middle class domesticity. I can remember it well. I'm just looking to see if there's some stuff here. And we talk about the baby boom. There's many theories why it happened. Uh, you know, service people coming home, mostly men, and there's this pent up need to propagate children, something like that. Largely, it was out of economic viability. Families had money, they had larger homes, they had the ability to support larger families. And, and some of that is, is part of the analysis as well. I'm not going to get into it, but there was also the phenomenon to how to raise kids during a time psychology really took off. Dr. Spock, I remember watching that Dr. Spock from Star Trek. Uh, there was a guy named Dr. Spock on how to raise your kid the right way. And, you know, you don't want to raise him in a certain way. And, 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 and it was, it was all the rage. Everyone wanted to keep up with the Joneses on how best to raise your kids. But, you know, the undercurrent of rebellion was there too. The 1955 film, uh, Rebel Without a Cause with James Dean and um, Natalie Wood. Um, those were all in there. There was a sense of uh, tension with some folks about the staleness of that era, um, if you will. Challenging sexual mornings. Bruce, there's all there's a whole section here about Bruce Springsteen talking about Elvis. And when Elvis came on the stage, the genie was out of the bottle and he couldn't back, back in. It, it created, you know, music was basically a way to, in which uh, some people um, found to be a bit subversive. I think that comes out more in the 1960s, quite frankly. And we know gays and lesbians started to be more openly active about um, promoting their equality within society, but it was very, very small beginnings because we know it was actually criminal in many districts uh, throughout the United States to be homosexual. It was still deemed a mental illness uh, until almost recent history in many respects, but they were, they were starting to become more... Um, in the open, if you will, and, and, and demanding civil rights uh, like other groups. Ideology, the prosperity, renewed belief in the superiority of capitalism. Hey, if we're all doing great, obviously capitalism works. Democracy needs to be safe for capitalism. And there was these this view that capitalism is, is akin to godliness. And, and it's almost like people were able to basically sell the concept of the success of capitalism is democracy, democracy is capitalism. We often get that confused. So when people talk about a communist nation, they assume it's not a democracy. It's not necessarily true, but I think a lot of politicians and a lot of cultural influencers during this era were able to tie in the two. Everything from Christianity, capitalism, and democracy were really one theme. And although it's very dangerous to think like that because it's not true, but that was the phenomenon of the era. And if you were deviant and believed that, well, you know, like a more socialist society or more communistic view or something like that, you were thought of as anti-democracy, anti-American, anti-patriotic, and probably non-Christian or, or Christian Judeo ethic would, would, would be put at, at, at a challenging uh, crossroads, if you will. 
And they talk about the different economic views of the time, libertarian views of economics, which is basically laissez-faire is becoming big. Business knows what's the best for business and business, it, like the business of whatever, what, what's good for GM, General Motors, is good for America, was the attitude. That was the slogan, and people bought into it significantly. Um, they talk about how there was a split in the Republican Party. One was uh, a sort of a moderate view um, that some of the things that FDR, you know, the New Deal created, like um, unemployment and union rights and labor rights and um, unemployment, Social Security, those things shouldn't be taken away, um, but otherwise government should stay out. But there was a more conservative group under a guy by the name of Taft out of Ohio, and that's that's the the, the son of William Howard Taft, the former president, the former member of the Supreme Court, much more radical conservative, wanted to do away with all the New Deal criteria. So the Republican Party was split there in this era. And what saved it and really brought it to a certain um, degree of success was Ike. Eisenhower, the great American hero of World War II, also the, uh, the leader of the NATO forces, um, he was... Uh, he was untouchable. In fact, the Democrats tried to recruit him as well. He's a moderate. He's a middle of the road. Or he was very, very cautious as a politician. And maybe that's what America needed at the period of time. Um, and so Eisenhower felt the best way to stop communism was to undercut its appeal by alleviating you know, the conditions under which it was most attractive. Um, and here's what I love his quote. This is his quote. Eisenhower, you know, kind of bland in some ways in, in history, but I, I think he was a pretty bright guy. And if you listen to this quote, I think he really nails how his party really needed to proceed for success. He said, should any political party attempt to abolish Social Security, which is extremely popular, unemployment insurance, essential, eliminate labor laws and farm programs, political suicide, right? You would not hear of that party again in political history. It's true. There's some things you just can't move away from once they're established. And Eisenhower knew that. He was a very centrist road. very, very popular. I collect a lot of political buttons. You can't see them all up there, but uh, there's I have a whole section just on I like Ike. The, Truman knew he was going to lose, although Truman already had done a significant portion of Eisenhower's um, of, of FDR's last term, got elected in his own right in 1948 against a very popular uh, Republican. Everyone thought he was going to win Thomas Dewey. And many of you remember that. If you like to study political history, everyone predicted he was going to lose in 1948. And the newspaper came out a little early and he held it up. You know, uh, Dewey defeats Truman. And Truman actually won in a fairly significant election uh, because he was more popular in the polling processes of that time were, were flawed. Um, but Truman probably knew the gig was up. He wasn't going to win his own second term in his own right. Uh, the, the, the Korean War was at a standstill. It was not going very well. Um, Congress wasn't getting a lot of things done, and that imbued a certain degree of unpopularity with Harry Truman. So Harry Truman decides not to run for re-election, and he supports a guy by the name of Adelie Stevenson, uh, one of my favorite characters in history. He's just an intellectual egghead, and Americans tend to reject that. Not entirely. You know, you've got the nomination of the Democratic Party. But we tend to like a little bit more of a well-rounded candidate. And he was, he was a great guy, very soft-spoken, very erudite. Um, but he runs like, he's running against a rock star in Ike Eisenhower, the winner of World War II. And he gets um, he gets crushed. <laughs> Poor Adelie Stevenson. One of my favorite political buttons of Adelie Stevenson is he would go door-to-door, -door, which is kind of an archaic way of campaigning for national office. And he had, there was photographs of him caught candidly, you know, at the bottom of his shoe, and he had holes in the bottom of his shoes because he was walking around so much. So there was only different meetings trying to win the campaign. Great guy, good man, uh, but loses. I think, I don't know if he lost every state, but he lost a significant portion of the country. It's certainly electoral college. Oh my God, he got creamed. And uh, Ike is so popular. The economy's booming. It's hard to throw out somebody in office when things are going well. The Korean War gets resolved through stalemate, but it still gets resolved. You know, we're pretty much for the most part, other than the Cold War, we're at peace in the world. And uh, Ike's up for re-election. Who does he get to run against the second time? Adelie Stevenson gets appointed, nominated again. But what becomes interesting, and we'll go into that next chapter, uh, one of my historical sort of hobbies is studying the uh, John F. Kennedy and Bobby Kennedy. And John F. Kennedy wanted to run in 1956 as the vice president candidate. Back then, the conventions had a lot of control. It wasn't through popular election the way it is quite now. 
Um, and he looked like he was going to pull it off. He was going to be the Democratic nominee for vice president under Adelie Stevenson. His father didn't want him to do it. He says political suicide. Ice going to win re-election. What are you, crazy? You know, I think even Joe Kennedy was going to vote for uh, <laughs> Ike anyways. And uh, Estes Koffer ended up pulling up the surprise, uh, come from behind victory to become the Democratic nominee. But John F. Kennedy's concession speech at the 1956 uh, Democratic convention was very very sweet, very poetic, and very supportive of the candidacy of Ida Lee Stevenson and Coffer. And um, it really catapulted him to the 1960 uh, nomination. But it's really interesting. Eisenhower was very, very popular in his period of time. He wasn't like engaging and exciting. He didn't say exciting, crazy, wild things. Um, but he led the country, you know, and he, and he had a very difficult time getting any kind of legislation passed because presidents don't pass legislation, but they usually have a legislative agenda. They put it through Congress. And because the conservative Republicans hated him because the Republican Party was still split and the liberal Democrats didn't think he was doing enough in terms of social programs, everything he tried to, not everything, many of the things he tried to do w wouldn't move forward. But the, the society was doing well as a whole. Not everyone, again, was sharing in the affluent society, but as a whole, it was... Uh, an interesting era. Uh, the one thing that I have a friend of mine who's a, a very uh, staunch Republican, he can never give credit to anything the Democrats do. And he and I talk a lot. And one day he was coming, goes, would you say Ike was one of the greatest presidents of all time? Like, well, I don't know. It was a good time in American history. I mean, I don't know. You know. And he goes, oh, the interstate um, highway system that we have. And if you go on, sometimes you'll see five stars on a thing. And it'll say the Eisenhower interstate system and the five stars to rec uh, represent his five star general status, because many of the major interstates that were built in America were built in the 1950s under Eisenhower's administration through legislation. I'm like, yeah, I guess it's a big deal. But is, is it really exciting to talk about highway system being developed? I don't know. Anyways, yeah, it talks about Ike's domestic legislation achievements were largely limited to expanding Social Security a little bit. Health care. He actually wanted to do national health care back then. A lot of people don't give him credit. He actually wanted to pass a national type of health care thing that we had to wait all the way until the Obama administration to get one passed. He got it shot down because liberal Democrats didn't think it went far enough and conservative Republicans would have no part of it. So he, he, he shot down two to one. So he couldn't get a lot of domestic stuff done. He was largely, again, expanding a little bit of Social Security, expanding some education and welfare money in uh, raising the cabinet position of the uh, Health and Human Welfare Agency um uh, bolstering federal support for education particularly in the math and sciences because we know we were fighting over sputnik and we were scared that the soviet bloc was becoming more advanced in terms of technology um but boy it was uh middle of the road philosophy guide his foreign policy domestic agenda he kept the united states from direct interventions by bolstering anti-communist aid pro-capitalist allies um the centerpiece of, you know, in the centerpiece of his Soviet policy was we were going to do massive retaliation if there was any threat to American interests. And that basically kept the form of detente to actually exist. Uh, while Ike's mainstream middle way won broad popular support, his own party was slowly moving away from this position. By 1964, the party had moved far enough to the right to nominate Senator Barry Goldwater. Uh, we know 1960 is... Um, Nixon. Nixon was also very conservative. He was Ike's vice president. But Barry Goldwater, talk about right of center. And I love Barry Goldwater in terms of, you know, he's an interesting character and he's a nice man. But conservative ideology, you can't get any more conservative than uh, Barry Goldwater. Um, you know, so the political moderation of the uh, affluent society proved little more than a way station on the road to liberal reforms and more distant conservative ascendancy to a rise of true conservatism. Interesting chapter. I talked way too long, but uh, it's fascinating during this period of time. I didn't live it. My father did, uh, and people of a generation. And, and before I got involved in history, I think I was just sort of a naturally curious person about what happened in the past. And to be a, a white American during this period of time, white male American during this period of time, you know, your world was your oyster and you had a lot of opportunity, especially if you're a GI coming back with the GI Bill, you can go to college basically for not only for free, you would actually get a stipend to go. So it opened up the door to college that might not have been ever either accessible to you in, in other eras. And it's not that other minority groups didn't thrive during this period of time, but the thriving was muted. If you lived in the wrong community, if you were, especially if you're south of the Mason-Dixon line, segregation and racial um, um, 
Jim Crow laws would often keep you behind um, uh, the starting point of the race. You know, you're running a race, and if you're 10 feet behind when it starts, you're not going to be able to finish at the same rate other people would. Um, and I just think it's interesting how that, that, that reverberates through history. And the good news, uh, to leave you with this thought, is part of the reason why we study history is to see how it changes and how it evolves. And for the most part, it's been evolving in the right way. And we did, in the 1950s, create through case law, through legislation, and through awareness, a more equitable society. And, and hopefully we're still continuing to move towards that. But this 1950s that we had that really, some people call it a woke moment, but basically an awakening to the injustices that were occurring um, in different segments of our society. I'll leave you on that note. Be well. Talk to you soon.